ओम नमः भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमः भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमः भगवते वासुदेवाय So we are studying this section from the Srimad Bhagavatam, the first canto. There are ten subject matters in Srimad Bhagavatam. The first subject matter is called Sarga, creation. So Prabhupada entitles the first canto, creation. In the Bhagavad Gita, there are five subject matters. Ishwar, God, Jiva, the living entity, Prakriti, the material energy, Kala, time, and Karma, activities. So, in the first chapter, the sages of Naimi Sharanya, headed by Shaunaka Rishi, placed six questions to Sutta Goswami. So from chapter 2 onwards, Sutta Goswami has been answering those questions. One of those questions was in regards to the Lord's incarnations or avatars. The Lord descends from the spiritual world down to the material world. So this particular section that we're studying tonight is concerning those incarnations. Let's look at the first selection, which is text number 26 of chapter 3. Chapter 20, uh, chapter 3, excuse me. Chapter 3 is entitled, Krishna is the source of all incarnations. This is the same thing that Krishna himself says in the Bhagavad Gita. In chapter 7, Krishna says, Mattak parataram na anyat. There is no truth superior to me. And in chapter 10, the first of the Chatu Shloki, he says, Aham sarvasya prabhava. Mattak sarvam pravartate. Everything comes from me. So the statements of Krishna in Bhagavad Gita are also stated throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam. Please repeat. Avatara hi asankyeya. Hare sattva nidher dvija. Yata vidvasina kulya. Sarasasyu Sahashvasha. O Brahmanas, the incarnations of the Lord are innumerable, like rivulets flowing from inexhaustible sources of water. So, in the Sanskrit, the word asankyeya, innumerable, the way to understand that, you cannot count. That's what it means. It is beyond your calculation. And notice the word Hare is used. Hare, meaning God, Krishna. And he gives us an analogy how to understand these uncountable incarnations of God. The example is like rivulets flowing from inexhaustible sources of water. Let's go to the next verse. Please repeat. Rishayo manavo deva Manuputra mahaujasa Kalasarava harer eva Saprajapataya smrita 
all the rishis, manus, demigods, and descendants of Manu, who are especially powerful, are plenary portions or portions of the plenary portions of the Lord. This also includes the Prajapatis. So, earlier in this chapter, Sutta Goswami listed about 20 or more different avatars. But he did not distinguish because there are six different kinds of avatars. Leela or pastime avatars. Shakyavesh, empowered living entities. Yuga avatars who appear to establish the principles of religion for each age. The Manbantara avatars. There are 14 Manus. Those Manus are empowered by Krishna. And in each Manbantara, there is a personality of Godhead. Then there is the Purusha avatar. There is Gar Garbodakshai Vishnu, Shirodakshai Vishnu, and Mahavishnu, who are the incarnations or super souls in the material universe. And then there's one more, the uh, Guna avatars, Lord Brahma, empowered to create, Lord Shiva, empowered to destroy, and Lord Vishnu himself, who maintains. So here, Sutta Goswami is saying that there are either plenary or full portions of God or portions of that. Now we come to the, this next verse is the verse from which all the verses of the Bhagavatam are explaining. What's that? Yes, so this verse is like the original root of all the 18,000 verses. So please repeat. Ete chang shakala pungsa Krishna's tu bhagavan swayam Indriyari vyakulam lokam Mridayanti yuge yuge. All of the above mentioned incarnations are either plenary portions or portions of the plenary portions of the Lord. But Lord Sri Krishna is the original personality of Godhead. All of them appear on planets whenever there is disturbance created by the atheists. The Lord incarnates to protect the theists. So, if you read one chapter in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, chapter 2, Krishna Das Kaviraj goes into an in-depth explanation of the significance of this verse. So if you have the interest, you can read that second chapter of the Adi Lila and you will get more insight to the meaning of this verse. But for now, the main thing is that second line. Krishna's tu Bhagavan Swayam. We should note that he specifically uses the word Krishna. He did not say Narayan. He did not say Durga. He did not say Ganesh. He did not say Shiva. He gives the exact terminology, Krishna. So this line, Krishna's tu Bhagavan Swayam, this is the whole Bhagavatam is explaining this in 18,000 verses. And notice, the second half of the verse reminds us of Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says Paritranaya sadhunam 
Vinashayacha Duskritam. I come to destroy the demons and to deliver the devotees. Same concept here. We shall go now to the next verse. Janmaguyam Bhagavato Yaetat Prayato Naraha Sayang Pratar Grinan Bhaktya Dukha Gramad Vimuchyate Whoever carefully recites the mysterious appearances of the Lord with devotion in the morning and in the evening gets relief from all miseries of life. So Sutta Goswami has blessed us. Here we are in the evening and we're hearing about the appearances of the Lord. So we should be getting relief from the miseries of life. And in the morning, earlier in this Bhagavatam, Prabhupada wrote that morning time is the optimum time for spiritual practice. Because in the morning, the mode of goodness is flourishing. And the mode of goodness is very conducive to spiritual life. So, this is our blessing that if we recite the appearances, we will get relief from the miseries of life. Next verse. Etad rupang bhagavato Hiya rupasya chit atmana Maya gunair vicharitam Mahadadbir Atmani. The conception of the Virat, universal form of the Lord, as appearing in the material world, is imaginary. It is to enable the less intelligent and neophytes to adjust to the idea of the Lord's having form, but factually, the Lord has no material form. So, we will find in Canto 2, when Shukadeva Goswami begins his actual teachings to Maharaj Parikshit, he goes into a detailed description of this Virat Rupa, or universal form. And the same thing is expressed by Shukadev, that it is simply for the person who cannot accept the spiritual form of the Lord or the deity form. That is who this Virat or universal meditation is for. It's a way of conceiving the gross material world in terms of a personal, gross, materialistic form. Although Krishna displayed a universal form at the assembly at Hastinapur, when Dhritarashtra finally got vision for a short spell, he saw Krishna's universal form, and Krishna manifested a universal form to Arjuna and we recall Krishna says in order for you to see it I have to give you those kind of eyes that vision and when Vamana Dev uh, took away the universe from Bali Maharaj he also displayed a universal form but the fact still remains. <coughs> the Lord has no material form. The deity, again, is not material. Even though it's made of material elements, this is why what we do is not idol worship. 
if it was a material form, then it would be idol worship. But we do not accept the deity. Even though it's made of material elements, we don't consider it material. We consider the deity form as good as Krishna himself. It's just a question of purifying the senses and then we will realize. You may recall that chapter in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Sakshi Gopal, where the young Brahmin speaks to the deity Gopal. I'm going to call on you to bear witness because the old Brahmin has said he will give his daughter to me in marriage. So I may need you to testify. And the deity responded, How can I testify? And the young Brahmin said, If you can talk, you can walk. So when he came back, he convinced the deity, Yes. So that story of Sakshi Gopal demonstrates that the deity form is not material because right here Sutta Goswami is pointing out factually the Lord has no material form. His form is spiritual. Let's continue. Yata nabasi meghau go Rainorva Partivo nile Evang drastari drishyat vam Aropitam abudabi Clouds and dust are carried by the air But less intelligent persons say That the sky is cloudy And the air is dirty Similarly they also implant material, material bodily conceptions on the spirit self. So this verse emphasizes the concept that even though we are in this material world, actually the soul is not actually affected by the material energy. It is the mind which is affected. But because we have given power of attorney over to the mind, we suffer material tribulations. And that's why throughout Bhagavatam, the concept of the dream is very important to understand. First of all, the whole material universe and the creation is the dream of Mahavishnu. He's sleeping in spiritual slumber and from his breathing, the universes are generated. So that's one level of dream. The other level of dream is that we are actually right now in the spiritual world. We are dreaming that we're here in placentia. Even though we're awake, the Vedic scriptures, this Bhagavatam, many places, most notably in the Uddhava Gita, repeatedly Krishna tells Uddhava, material existence is a dream. So, when we identify as man or woman or as American or Indian, that is a dreaming condition. Therefore, that song by Lord Chaitanya, sung by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Gora Chandra Bole, Kota Nidra Jao Maya, Pishachira Kole. My dear living entity, wake up. Wake up. You have placed your head on the lap of the witch called Maya. So, 
to wake up from the dream because we're dreaming right now. The way to wake up from the dream is to hear and chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Let's do another verse. Atak param yad avyaktam. Ayudaguna brimhitang. Adrishtat sruta vastuvat. Sajivo yad punar bhavaha. Beyond this gross conception of form is another subtle conception of form which is without formal shape and is unseen, unheard, and unmanifest. The living entity has his form beyond this subtlety, otherwise he could not have repeated births. So what is this verse telling us? We have a gross body consisting of the senses, ten senses, five knowledge-acquiring senses, and five working senses. But then he says, besides this gross conception, there is a subtle, and that's mind, intelligence, ego, or we say false ego, or according to uh, Kapil Dave, there's a fourth item, contaminated consciousness. Because consciousness is originally pure. That's why Prabhupada writes, the original consciousness is Krishna consciousness. Any other consciousness, that's impure or material contaminated consciousness. So that's the subtle body, the subtle form, which he says, without shape, unseen. I can't see your mind. I can only see your face. I can guess what you're thinking, but I really don't know. So it's unseen, unheard, unmanifest. The living being has his form beyond this, meaning the soul is beyond even mind intelligence. This is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita chapter 3. The hierarchy is given at the end of chapter 3. The senses are superior to the sense objects. But higher than the senses, the mind. Higher than the mind, intelligence. Higher than the intelligence, the soul. So, the living being has his form beyond this subtlety otherwise you could have not have repeated birth so what does that tell us at the time of death we leave the gross body but that subtle body stays with the soul that's why we say you've had your mind for millions and millions of lifetimes that subtle body stays tightly around the soul until the point of liberation. One of Kapila Dave's instructions is that the process of bhakti dissolves the subtle body. When the subtle body is completely dissolved, what remains? Pure soul. What is Lord Chaitanya's first instruction? Cheto Darpana Marjanam. Cleanse that subtle body. Cheto Darpana Marjanam. Cheta. Cheta means consciousness, or it can mean the mind or the heart. It's the same idea. You cleanse that subtle body, then you will become liberated. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. We'll take our first break here. 
I would request 